And we're starting this afternoon uh, with a topic that really has, uh, has emerged over the last seven, eight years, at least at API conferences, which is the, the API as a product mindset. And the API is a product term, but we'll see what does that mean. And also how to think it carefully to make it uh, to make it a success in your company. And for that, we have one of the best people to talk about it, which is, which is Jason, who is Jason Harmon, CTO of Stoplight and an uh, API expert, uh, you know, from... Uh, from, from the, the, like, say, the... Um, you can say I'm old, Matty. It's okay. Sorry? <laughs> it sounded like you are going to say from way back or something. You can just yeah, say from, I'm old. From, old. From, it's okay. I don't know. So long, I don't even remember. So, yeah, <laughs> Jason, let's go. Let's go. But why you should treat your API as product? Indeed. Thanks for the generous intro, Matty. Um, so, uh, as Matty said, I'm Jason. I'm CTO at Stoplight.io. Uh, kind of oversee um, all the geeky stuff, engineering, product, security, IT, all those things. Um, and I think most relevant to today is actually uh, hosting the API Intersection podcast has really given us a, a fantastic way to kind of learn what's working at successful programs. Um, but I also have a background as a, a practitioner myself, not just working in, in sort of tool providing uh, at places like Expedia Group or PayPal that you probably heard of, and then other startups you might not have. Um, so there you go. You have maybe reasons to listen to me. <laughs> so uh, my quick plug, and this will be it for Stoplight. Uh, we're an API design platform um, that you can think of as like the Figma for APIs. So we kind of help people, um, you know, in larger places through their transformations, in smaller places, uh, trying to avoid having a future transformation. <laughs> Uh, so, simply put, uh, we talk to a lot of folks that do this sort of thing and, uh, you know, hear from them what works and doesn't. And that's, uh, you know, our attempt at API Interface here is to kind of share some of our learning. So, I think our, you know, kind of the basis when we think about, um, you know, how APIs have kind of come front and center to become products is we really have to ask the question, like, what's the business value? You know, if you're a business leader, why do you invest in these things? And for me, the last 10, 15 years, I feel like I've spent more energy on this than anything, uh, especially in kind of more product-ish roles. But I think we're over a hump now in the last couple of years. Um, I really appreciated uh, Van Elstein's uh, study that they published about in Forbes, um, that in simple terms, if you're really investing in APIs the right way, you will outgrow your competitors. So I think, you know, we have this kind of business climate now where folks have started to key in that this is a very strong competitive advantage if done well. Over the last 16 years, you know, these API first companies have shown a 38% uh, positive growth versus their competition. So, you know, for those folks here who are finding themselves in the realm of API product, uh, this is a great one to point to if you have sort of exec types who kind of still don't get it. Um, and that said, there's plenty of other great evidence. I'd certainly point to Postman's kind of state of the API thing. It was something like 98% of companies are investing in APIs now. So we, we have reached this kind of like, you know, uh, adoption, hump, you know, part of the adoption curve where it's, it's a very mainstream thing now, right? Um, but I think it's helpful from the business perspective, you know, kind of the business community perspective, how these things are looked at is often a little different than we're used to in more kind of engineering circles. So I often call this like in the engineering world, we think of it in the MIT model of, you know, we're building a distributed componentized system and that's great. But when you're in the product realm, you know, you need to be able to speak business. So what a lot of tech uh, kind of leaders are looking for now, um, you know, that that I think is meshing well between technology and business is this idea of a composable business. And uh, so I think this is, it's really an analog to a lot of that kind of MIT oriented thinking in Harvard language. Um, so composable business is the simple idea that, you know, we've got these, these Lego building blocks we can plug together, you know, at this very modular way of building things. Um, and I think there's implied in that a very customer centric mindset. 
But for what it's worth, um, in a lot of places, if you really start asking the right questions, the reason that APIs are coming to the forefront is about building a marketplace. Um, you know, this idea that you're, you're attracting producers of something and then you have an audience of consumers who want to use that and you're just facilitating that interaction. So we're all familiar with sort of the Ubers and Airbnbs of the world, but I think these concepts are spreading to many other businesses and sh uh, creating a shift in thinking out of kind of the 80s, 90s MBA school of thought on pipeline oriented business and into a more marketplace way of operating. So I call these things out in part, uh, not only to help sort of, you know, sell this on a business basis, but also just how to translate right into, um, into kind of terms that are familiar in the business world. Um, so, okay, you know, I don't, uh, you're attending an API interface, API days thing. You probably think these are important. I'm gonna have to convince you. Uh, but with that backdrop, let's start thinking about, you know, how do we, how do we do this as a product? And my starting point with these discussions when folks go, you know, hey, we want to invest in, you know, API first or whatever, you know, the latest tagline is that no one knows what it means. Uh, you know, it's like, OK, what are you doing from a product standpoint? And a lot of times there's this wringing of hands, this concern that, well, we ha we're doing APIs as products. We have to do something radically different. And I always like to remind folks it's just another product, right? Like, don't. Don't get wrapped around the axle with coming up with new ways of doing product management. You just have a different audience with, with different needs than maybe you're used to in kind of point and click or you know touch the, uh, touch the screen kind of apps. This is a headless thing, so it does take some slightly different approaches. But um, you know the old school product management fundamentals work here just like it does in you know selling parking garages or storage units. Uh, you know it's just a product. So uh, kind of our agenda, some of the highlights, if you attended my governance talk yesterday, I gave this kind of teaser on these kind of three areas of focus. Uh, one is kind of building off of or recognizing relationships and how you sort of frame your API projects, um, which sets us up for how to kind of gain that business buy-in uh, and make sure that your product doesn't end up, uh, you know, one of the bodies littered on the road of API products. So there are many. Um, and then finally, kind of how to think about um, testing and how you define acceptance criteria. So uh, the first one, recognizing relationships, uh, before we get into it too much, this very simply is to say that if you build a really well, uh, you know, a, a really reusable concept as an API, this could be used by a wide variety of different consumers. And this is many times where people get stuck, is trying to sort of build you know, the one API that's going to rule them all and that you're gonna figure it all out. And uh, people will find themselves a year or two down the road having shipped nothing. So uh, this is kind of a, a way to start thinking about that from the start. And first and most important, and you'll probably hear me say this a few times, is, is being customer centric about it. Um, it's really easy when you know, you're working with engineering teams who are developing the APIs to have a very system centric view of things. Um, and it's almost impossible for API developers to not think that way. They can't help it. That's the world they're living in. So uh, a big part of the product manager's job is to be the advocate for the API consumers. And so you can't do that unless you know who the customer is going to be. Um, and that's, I think, job one for an API product manager is what's the audience that we're building this product for? Right, which is again, an old school product management thing. It's not a new idea. So a way to start figuring that out and kind of step two is in most places, there's already some kind of API and it's probably not very good and you wanna make it better and you wanna reshape this into something that's gonna be you know, a more reusable, modular, composable kind of thing. This is a common story. Uh, it's not that you know, there's really these days, not a lot of folks that are starting from scratch. Uh, they're trying to improve on what they did before. So go talk to the folks that are the power users, right? I investigate kind of who's using it the most, who's generating the most revenue, whatever it is uh, that, that the old model saw successful and get them on the phone, right? Talk to them, figure out what are they, what's the job they're really trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish? This is a good leg up on figuring out what relationships might already work. Um, and if you don't have that, 
there's probably in your sort of product management, um, you know, requests, folks who are asking for things. Um, and those who are asking interesting or innovative questions, go talk to them, find out what they need. Again, old school product management, right? Go talk to the customer. Uh, don't get caught up in the numbers too much. And when you get down to that, some of the things you're really looking for um, and these two kind of bullets are really about, let's separate, are we giving your customers their own data or are we giving other platforms, your partners, access to that customer's data? And the reason this is super relevant right up front is it's going to radically change how you do authentication and authorization. Um, and if you've never taken on one of these API projects, quite often that's the long pull in the tent. That's the hard part. You know, the old adage goes that if you're doing a two day hackathon, day one is getting everyone authenticated and, and uh, authorized. And day two, they actually build stuff. Um, it's, it's hard on everyone, right? Uh, but it, especially with the increasing vector of security attacks, it's important to think about this stuff very early. Um, and I say that because like the scope of your auth that uh, that's going to be involved in this could radically change your kind of delivery time frames. So, for example, if you're just providing customers their own data, they probably need a pretty simple kind of API token, API key type approach, as opposed to if you're trying to integrate with other platforms, you're going to need OAuth, right? You're going to need a way to capture customer consent to give access to their data to someone else. And that's a way harder thing to tackle. Um, so these are just some of the basic practical reasons to ask it up front. But it's also that the functionality required is probably really different. And if you look at those two different things, you're probably looking at two different APIs um, because the needs are you know, significantly different. So um, think like a customer. To do that, you got to talk to customers. And customer in the API world could be partners. It could be actual customers. Or in some cases, it could be internal in nature only, and those customers are just other departments, divisions, whatever. So start there, get that part right, and don't get caught up in trying to boil the ocean of all potential scenarios as step one. Um, this is you know, kind of capturing the same concept, uh, know who the consumer is, and, and the business relationship that you'll be building. And this is the other reason to start with relationships, is so that you can understand what's the commercial model going to look like around this? And if there's not a commercial model, i.e., you know, it's something internal only in nature, what's the, what's the success measure regardless, right? If you go build this API, what is the expectation that you're setting that it's going to do for this company's growth? Um, old school product management, right? You got to justify stuff. Don't go build things that you don't have clear expectations on what it's going to deliver. Um, and again, depending on the business relationship, those outcomes are going to look very different. So don't get caught up in ocean, uh, you know, boiling the ocean. Um, this is true for technical uh, standards, too, for those sort of, uh, you know, engineering types who are here trying to figure out what to tell their product manager to do. Uh, you know, the same applies for like, don't try to, to define every standard you can think of up front. Get what you need to go ship something and then refine. And the same is true with the product side. Pick a constituency, a relationship set, a business relationship type, get it right, and then adapt to the other relationship types. Okay, so we've done our homework. We've talked to customers. We know who we're building it for and what positive outcomes that it's going to produce. That's a great way to start justifying why something should be on the roadmap. And, you know, in many companies, this is about convincing, I use executives loosely here, right? In smaller companies, this could, uh, well, in, in some companies, this might be a director or whatever, but whoever your leadership is on the business side, um, you know, they need to be bought in that this is a smart strategic move. Um, so I'm going to say it again, API is no different than any other product. Um, you need kind of the traditional business management to understand why this matters. So going off and building API uh, products without that, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not good. You're probably not going to finish that project. It's probably going to get canceled. But more importantly, I think for a lot of product teams is recognizing that building a one-off API for one use, uh, one use case, one relationship, 
uh, is a bad idea. We want something reusable that many relationships can be built from, which is really talking about building an API program, right? And this is going to be a partnership with, uh, with engineering and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, uh, if you're going to do all that, try to do something company wide, you've got to have the business bought in. So a couple of things. Um, before you go ask for that meeting, before you you know have your roadmap update coming up or whatever, is how does the API that we plan to build fit into today's business model? And I, I say this because in many cases these pushes toward you know we're we're a traditional company that's going to become a platform company, and that's kind of the the hand wavy goal. Is you have to accept that you're probably going to change how the business operates. And setting those expectations early is important. If you go do something that's going to upset the apple cart, um, these things can be seen as a threat rather than an opportunity. So if you already have a shift in kind of revenue happening from these traditional channels, perhaps into more integrated flows, it's good to set that context and that this is part of a bigger shift. If you don't have that shift, setting expectations on why this is a better approach, really good to get grounded. The second bit is, of course, back to success measures. How are we going to show when this actually launches that it worked? Um, and I think one of the, the more naive mistakes in a common, you know, kind of anti-pattern is we're going to measure how this API works on some technical technical operation measures. The, the typical one is like, here's how many calls we get to the API. Now, in some places, if you have something that that an API call implies a business transaction, that could be a decent proxy to something meaningful, but in most cases, you're better off framing this around, um, you know, kind of what the business measure is that that API call affects. So, you know, don't, don't even show the technical operation measures if you can avoid it to kind of the executive crowd because it's just completely alienating. Show what that call is enabling. And then finally, I said it before, is like know when you're going into a marketplace. Know if this kind of API suite, perhaps, that you're, you're planning out is going to shift things into a more marketplace-oriented uh, construct. The idea that you're attracting producers, you're attracting consumers, and facilitating an interaction. Because you need to explain it in that sort of supply and consumption paradigm rather than uh, this sort of call the API and a transaction happens. Right? It's going to be a bigger picture more of a flow um, and if you're not speaking in that language it's not going to fit into their mental model but you know all of this kind of takes us to if you're not putting the right business perspective around apis when you put these things on the roadmap it's real easy to kill uh, as a project when the crunch comes whether that be an economic crunch like where a lot of us are facing now or just you know general kind of business belt tightening um, if if business folks don't understand why the apis are important and what they're enabling in growth for the business um, it's going to be the thing they reach for to kill as oh this is a technical project right um, and i say this because you know the the path to where we're at in the api world is littered with bodies right uh the, the many many things have been killed off that were great ideas because they didn't have the right business perspective built around them so don't do that and i think in a bigger frame of thinking is um you know again you don't want to build a commoditized technical art artifact when you, or you at least don't want to have that perception and most times perception is more important than reality so even if you're thinking of it that way you need to make sure everyone else is thinking of it that way that you've got great business alignment around it. But the other practical reason is you don't want to have an engineered experience. You know, in, in the UX world, if, um, you know, we were building sort of a point and click interface as a product, which many product managers are used to these days, and we said, we're just going to throw that to engineering and there's a bullet that says, do the thing. Um, we would laugh at you and say, why aren't you including designers in that? Why aren't you putting you know, studies and research into what's going to work well for a frictionless, great experience. The same is absolutely true for APIs. It's just a different audience, right? The end user uh, doesn't point and click. They write code against it. And reminder, uh, the tendency is things will fall into system-centric thinking. So go talk to that developer customer on how they see the world 
um, in terms of your product offering and craft it that way, design it that way, be intentional about it. So these are kind of two sides of the same coin in many ways, is you're building justification for why you're doing these things and you're building something that just makes sense to the end consumer and sets you up to fulfill those success measure expectations. All right, so we've got something on the roadmap. We've justified it. Business folks are bought in. We understand what the customer needs. Your next step as a product manager is don't release buggy APIs. Uh, you know, that are, that are full of problems or dead ends and error handling and that sort of thing. Your acceptance criteria, I think, is going to look pretty different than what you would typically put to like a point and click interface. Um, in that, you're building a programmatic interface. It is inherently uh, the most testable product you'll ever build. So you have no excuse for putting out big glaring bugs uh, and worse, uh, or more importantly, you shouldn't be re-releasing the same bugs, right? You should be able to prevent these things from ever happening again if you release something to the wild. And this is all to say that, you know, sort of automated acceptance criteria is key here. Um, I'm always a fan of anything that's scenario-based in terms of tooling, meaning the test does not pass because one API call worked. It's very common that you're going to have flow in your API calls. So as a a classic example in the payments world, kind of fintech, and something I was very familiar with at PayPal, you can't take a credit card transaction without an authorization. Thereby, you can't test that credit card transaction without testing multiple endpoints. Um, and there's OAuth consent flows, which certainly makes it trickier, but um, this, is, this is to say that build a scenario-based acceptance criteria in your testing so that you can say, you know, user wants to do this, they get this, and a series of things happen to fulfill that. So that you make sure that from a developer experience standpoint, it all works together. Um, again, no real excuse for low quality and APIs in my mind. Um, as a product manager, your sign-off process should be green lights. Uh, you shouldn't necessarily need to do, uh, you know, calling the API as a demo, as a way to do sign-off. You should have testing up front that defines what you expected in very concrete terms and those lights should turn green and when they're green you know you're good and i'm just going to say this bluntly as product managers don't just trust when your engineers say the api is done that's not good enough um, that's again throwing things over the fence to engineering and expecting um, that you're not going to get an engineered experience you will um, and yeah, again, automation by default, that should be the default choice. It should only be very difficult scenarios that you're going to struggle to put automation around that might require some manual intervention. But by and large, you should be able to automate your testing here. Um, this is not a brittle point and click user experience that's going to be flaky tests. These should be rock solid, reliable tests uh, by and large. So with all that, uh, one more little plug to uh, on, you know, you want to learn more about the API space, uh, definitely come check out our API Intersection podcast. Uh, this is a community of practitioners who come together to really just share what works. Uh, we don't chill for any products. Uh, you know, there's no sort of demos or selling things, especially Stoplight. Uh, so don't worry, we're not going to come uh, pin you in the corner and sell stuff to you. And with that, we have time for questions. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, one question about like the in mostly larger organization about the potential sponsorship or leadership to think API as a product. Do you think it should come from the tech side, the business side, both from a, a low net thinking uh, early, <laughs> you know, the, the, the PM product mindset? Um, I'll say that what I see most commonly as the kind of not to do is that your technical organization, you know, your engineering will typically have some kind of, you know, architectural push and it might be, you know, microservices oriented on how we're going to make independently deployable services and we're going to modularize the system and clean up code and all that stuff. That's great. But that strategy should be in lockstep with the business strategy on what the APIs are going to enable. And I think if you don't have those, that the business strategy plus the, um, the, the, the architectural strategy in line, uh, then you're just going to be fighting back and forth for resources. And uh, unfortunately, the business folks usually win when it comes to roadmaps. 
one question about like should all APIs must be treated as products in a sense that I just take the example to relay on this but like I was uh, pitching API as a product to a bank they were just having one API one service and an API on top to do like a compliance test you know like really something really really on the back end thing uh, never will probably never be public and they were telling me how much investment do I need to put to think them as a pro as a product so uh, yeah so the question is like should all APIs should be treated as products or must um, I just switch I just switched my mic. Hopefully that gets rid of the buzz. Everyone's complaining about the comments. Um, sorry, give me a recap of the question. I got to get too recap, distracted by the mic must, thing. No, no worries. Must or should all APIs to be treated as products? Oh, yeah, yeah. Got Even it. internal yeah. ones, like internal ones, which are really tiny yeah. really or really for one use case. Yeah, I got it. Um, you know, my advice is always um, be build something that will not take a long time to externalize. Um, increasingly, I think there are lots of partnership opportunities to integrate with other platforms um, that enable you know, business growth in an equitable way. And the struggle is if you say, well, this is just an internal API, we don't have to like, you know, meet all the rules, we don't have to make this pretty, it just has to work and uh, it's not gonna affect anyone, so no big deal. The problem is when you turn around and you have biz dev folks who say, we just signed a deal that in the next 60, 90 days, we're gonna integrate with this other platform. And your engineering comes back and says, well, we kind of built a steam pile of crap before, so we're gonna need six to nine months to completely re-engineer it. Um, I think that's where engineering teams kind of get caught with their pants down. And um, it's, it's not a good look. So my advice is always like, have, most of your kind of standards that you would uh, apply to your API development for something external, have most of those covered for your internal stuff. That way, when somebody suddenly says, can you ship this to the market and open it up to the world? The response is, sure, in about 60 days, we need a little cleanup time, but nothing massive. So I think for, for the engineering teams, that's good advice. And ultimately, that's what the product owners should be planning for is building something that has future externalization potential. Um, that's kind of the way to go. We started with internal adoption and shared leverage, but we laid the tracks to enable kind of further business growth. Um, that's a way to get promoted as a product manager. Yeah, so reduce the time to market, right? At minimum. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Perfect, Susan, thank you very much. Thank you for, for thank this. You. And, uh, yeah, see you at the next uh, API conference. Indeed, later, man. And we will continue with another point of view about someone who knows a lot about APIs as a product, which is Derek Gilling, CEO of Mossif. Hello, Derek. How are you? Doing good. Thanks for having me here today. So let's talk about how to monetize and productize your APIs right now. Awesome. Yeah, just a little bit about myself. I'm the CEO of Mossif, the leading API analytics and monetization platform. I love helping API-first businesses trying to figure out the, the PLG side of things around monetizing APIs, developing usage-based pricing. And if you're ever in San Francisco, I love IPAs. So you can find me at Zeitgeist and a couple of local bars there. Always hit me up. Here's my email. So why are we talking about monetizing and productizing APIs? Well, selling traditional SaaS is much harder today than it was five or 10 years ago. Traditionally, you know, folks would sign up for a SaaS tool for their team maybe it's 20 or 30 or even hundreds of, of different developers and, and users to perform different manual tasks, whether it's project management, leveraging the CRM, that type of stuff. But today, company customer requirements have changed drastically. They're looking for automation. They're trying to leverage AI, especially in 2023, they're trying to become much more efficient at their process. So what used to take you know, 20 people can now be done by a single developer just through an API. And so a lot of that value is also being transferred through APIs rather than a traditional UI. Lastly, you know, these different customers are looking for you know, targeted solutions. What used to be a one-stop shop for all the different processes that were required at a business through a UI are now becoming piecemeal. And so you can actually think of APIs as Legos and pick and choose the solution that makes the most sense for the business. But there's another trend that's been happening. Right, the buying power is shifting more and more towards individual developers. So if you look at circa 2003, for example, you know, the only people that were really purchasing software was a C-suite. And that's because to deploy 
you know, that type of on-prem expensive software, it took a lot of investment and a lot of planning. And so that was traditionally deployed throughout the entire organization. When we look at 2013, which was what I consider peak SaaS, you know, that uh, shifted towards department heads, team leads, you know, they could pick the, the tools that they wanted for their particular use case and for their team. But again, with, with the, the uh, peak API in 2023, what we see is, you know, this has accelerated drastically where a single developer can pick the solution that they want and, and go and adopt it. And so today we're actually going to talk about how do you actually productize these APIs and turn them into revenue and profit centers for the business. And notice here, I have a timeline which are all the different stages as you think about productizing APIs. The bottom half here are, are different engineering concerns, building, publishing, serving. But there's a lot of other business concerns which are on the top half here. How do you figure out the right business strategy, architect? And then how do you define the right KPIs to measure against? And lastly, do you iterate, do you deprecate, and how do you manage that process? So let's first just jump into the business strategy itself, which a lot of this is around pricing and packaging. But each API business is different. So you have to figure out what to charge for, how do you actually invoice your customers, is it prepaid versus postpaid billing, and how do you package that into a solution that's easy to understand for customers. So let's just first talk about what to charge. There's a lot of different metrics to look for when figuring out usage-based pricing and metering for your APIs. There's things like transaction volume, you know, for Cinch or Twilio, that might be number of text messages, number of faxes being sent, you know, the, the typical case with Stripe is, is a revenue or call share where they take 2.9% of every invoice. Um, we have other use cases like uh, Datadog, which will charge a number of gigabytes or number of log lines. We also have user-centric uh, uh, pricing schemes such as Segment where they price in uh, monthly active users or, or uh, um, and lastly, resource space, which we see a lot within infrastructure and, and the cloud vendors, things like Amazon Redshift, uh, Snowflake, where you're actually charging a number of compute hours or maybe it's number of VM hours. But notice for every single one of these, we're looking at customer value. We're not just charging on API calls. So those are not necessarily one in the same. The example here would be, you know, there's a lot of API calls that might fail. You know, you might have a batch endpoint where if your, your platform is text messaging platform, you might be able to actually batch and send a hundred text messages in a single API call. And so how do you actually figure out first the billing strategy that works for your customers? And there's two common billing strategies. One is prepaid billing, one is postpaid billing. When you look at prepaid billing, um, the customer is actually committing to some type of credits or quota ahead of time before they even consume your API. So this is great for cash flow for your business, especially if you're just starting out, it's a brand new project at your company, Maybe you're, you're trying to bootstrap a startup. So you can actually generate cash directly even before you know, your customers using those APIs. It's also a lot more familiar with enterprise because this is what you know, traditional SaaS pricing looked like. You'd subscribe for, for a particular plan and then use that plan for, for the next year or, or a couple of years, whatever that, that uh, a contract was defined for. But there can be a lot of friction created by trying to figure out how much usage I should subscribe for if I don't even know the uses in the first place, especially if this is a brand new project or solution. And it can also be much harder for pay as you go. Because again, now you're asking for a customer to commit to something that they don't even know what they're going to need. And so this is where postpaid can actually be really handy because now you can allow a customer to sign up and start using their service or your service without understanding these things. So it can make pay as you go a lot easier. But one of the tricky things is it can be abused so especially if you have very high cost vendors that you depend on to serve that API, then you might want to rethink whether postpaid makes sense. The other thing to think about is how do you actually package uh, your APIs to make sense from a customer standpoint? And there are two different ways, again, to think about packaging. One is a tiered pricing model, which we see a lot uh, borrowed from the traditional SaaS world, where you have a good, good a better, and a best plan. You also have pay-as-you-go, which is sometimes called consumption-based pricing or usage-based pricing. One of the great things with tiered pricing is it can enforce a minimum spend. So this can be really helpful, especially if you have very high support costs and you don't want 
to, to manage a, a very large number of low paying or low ACV customers. It's also much more predictable for customers. They know roughly what they're going to spend each month or each quarter or each year. And it's much easier to implement, especially if there's no usage-based component at all. You can have a very fixed quota, um, very well-defined set of features that they can be subscribed to. So super simple to get the first MVP out the door. But one of the hardest things to deal with with uh, a tier pricing is you have friction in expansion itself. It's very rigid. An example is let's say a developer signs up for the $100 a month plan, and, but they see $300 a month in value from your API. That means that Delta is now $200, right? Because their perceived value is much higher than what they're spending. But let's say your next plan, it jumps all the way up to 500 bucks, right? And so right now they're still getting $300 in value. So they need to actually go above 500 before it really makes sense for them to spend that $500 a month. And so that's one of the hardest things with tier pricing that is solved with pay as you go. With pay as you go, the customer gets to spend only what they need and what they consume, nothing more. So it's a much more efficient for the customer and it can appear a lot cheaper from a pricing standpoint. Um, but one of the hardest things here though, is gonna be a lot harder to implement. Now you need very accurate metering, you know, especially when you think about you know, gap accounting and when it was consumed and, and what if you know, it rolls over into the next month, you need to make sure it's audit friendly. So a lot of moving pieces when you implement some type of pay as you go model. The other big concern is you can surprise customers with billing surprises. For example, let's say that developer signs up for 50 bucks a month, but they just blow through their usage really rapidly. They deploy their integration to production and suddenly they get a $10,000 bill. No one wants to explain that to your manager, right? Like no one wants to say, oh gosh, I just spent $10,000 on this tool. So how do you manage customer expectations so they're not surprised? Lastly, around invoicing, this is more of a financial concern versus a product engineering concern but it does impact uh, your customers. And so the two popular models is recurring and threshold based. Recurring is, is more familiar again with the SaaS world. It's predictable for customers and it's also easier for your finance team because now you can recognize that revenue each month, each quarter, each year, you know exactly when it was consumed. However, it can have bad unit economics, especially for low cost SaaS and APIs. So for example, let's say you're using Amazon S3 uh, you can actually get started paying a couple pennies, but does it actually make sense to send a monthly invoice for five cents when that's all the usage they had? Um, it can also be very complex for, for prepaid. And this goes back to that pay as you go piece I mentioned earlier. And so this is where threshold can be really helpful. And this was popularized by the uh, ad tech industry. You know, if you use something like Google AdWords, you know, they have actually a threshold where they won't invoice you until you reach you know, a certain number of dollars in spend. Twilio is another example of this, but on the prepaid side, where you can actually purchase a number of credits and can use those credits in the next month, next quarter. It doesn't really matter. It can actually just roll over and you just keep burning those credits. And so the nice thing with threshold base is it reduces the transaction costs from a financial standpoint and, and a lot of the overhead for, with dealing with invoices. However, one of the hardest things to deal with is the revenue recognition piece, because now you purchase you know, $50 worth of Twilio credits, you can use some of them this month, maybe in, uh, some of them the next, you know, two weeks of the next month. So you have these weird boundaries that you have to now figure out. Another thing is now technically a company liability on the balance sheet, because now you have customers that have outstanding credits. So you have to now handle that appropriately. So we talked a lot about pricing and trying to figure out the right business strategy around the APIs. But now let's talk about how do you actually grow it? and turn this truly into a growing API product. And one thing to keep in mind is developers need buy-in from many stakeholders. So we mentioned earlier you know, that the buying power has been shifting to end users and developers. That's not the end game here, right? It's great to get a developer to, to, to use a product. But there's a lot of other things happening behind the scenes. And so they are probably researching your solution because you know, the executive team, VPs, have mentioned this is a project priority or a company priority. But again, there's still legal and security review to think about changing project priorities, financial procurement concerns, a lot of other mis missing pieces before that developer can really uh, start paying for your API, get it through procurement and get everything rolled out to production. 
So how do you accelerate this? Well, you can actually implement a self-service signup model. So this is part of the whole you know, PLG product-led growth thing that we keep seeing over and over, but it works really well for API products because that developer, even though they get to decide the tool that they want, it's not just their decision. But by allowing things like click-through terms of service and super simple, quick integration processes that might take only 50 minutes, they can get up and running and they can start paying a, a token amount just on a manager's credit card rather than waiting you know, 30 or 60 or whatever, how many days it takes to get through procurement. And so what we're trying to do here is land a lot of developers and just have them see a lot of value in the API. Get them to share the integration or the application with their colleagues, with their manager. Get them to show something. Hey, this is something cool. Now I need to keep investing more into this platform to get that MVP, that little uh, 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 POC into a full working solution. But because they're already to see that value, now they have buy-in from their leadership team, from their manager to continue to invest. So again, the main focus here is just get them to pay a token amount, whether that's 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, very small amount. But that doesn't mean you're, you're done, right? So the main goal for sales is really to sell through these developers, right? And so you have these users that are already on you know, these self-service platforms but what you're trying to figure out is what are enterprise requirements that they, they have, whether that's security, compliance, legal, they might also have expanding usage, right? Because again, even though that developer signed up, that might only be for a small PLC where the usage is very small, just a couple of different test accounts. They're, they're exploring the solution, but once they roll this out to production, the usage might look very, very different. And lastly, they might have a lot of other use cases they want to solve with your API. Because again, APIs are like uh, building blocks or like Legos. And so even though they're using one API, you might actually have some other APIs that are even more suitable and better and can solve their use case better. And so we like to actually talk about the PLG sales flywheel where you have a self-service developer user sign up. They get to their aha moment. Uh, we call that the, their first hello world, right? And then they start increasing their usage. But then that's when sales engages, right? Sales engages, and then they continue to identify new use cases, which accelerates that usage, and then sales engages again. And this cycle continues and continues and continues until that $50 a month developer turns into a much larger contract at the organization. But scaling self-service is really hard. There's going to be issues around onboarding. They're going to have questions, you know, around the API. Maybe they're going to have 400 or 500 errors. There's going to be changing business needs, right? Maybe one team was initially using the, the, the set of APIs, but now another set of teams also needs to start consuming these APIs. And just like I mentioned earlier, there's going to be billing surprises. There's going to be issues you're going to run into. And so how do you manage that, especially when you have not just 100 accounts to manage, but hundreds of thousands of different developers consuming your APIs? And so the best way to do that is create a great self-service experience. Make everything self-service as much as possible. So that way you are not in the loop. Your support staff is not doing mundane tasks such as, you know, adding team members or, or changing plans, doing simple things. Instead, they can actually focus more on the high value, which is being consultive with your customer base, um, making sure they get the most value. And so creating these different self-service uh, whether it's dashboards or so usage, whether it's you know sending out an email when you know they're getting a, 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 a getting closer to quota limits or or maybe their usage spike by a certain percentage, just over communicating so they can uh, manage their account themselves. And this way, they can manage it on their own time, even if it's at two in the morning. And so again, trying to avoid billing surprises by over communicating. So one of the best things you can do is send out emails regularly depending on where the usage uh, sits. So we talked quite a bit around how to grow your API product and turn that into a revenue center, but now how do you actually measure that growth? Are you on track you know, to meet the, the right uh, uh, goals that you set for this API program? Because at the end of the day, you're investing into your APIs to probably generate revenue, maybe if it's a partner API to generate partner relationships, maybe to help increase the uh, amount of uh, um, uh, features and use cases around your platform, 
but there are certain goals that you want to define so that you can measure against. And so one thing to keep in mind is treat your API as a product. And what that means is you should be looking at product metrics and not necessarily uh, infrastructure metrics. Product metrics are usually aligned to one of these three goals. Number one is adoption. How many different developers are starting to adopt and use the APIs? The second is engagement. What is the breadth and depth of usage? How many different APIs are they using? And for each API, how, what does that usage look like? Is it a very small amount? Are they, are they using it a lot? Um, a lot of different end users you know, that, that are actually sending transactions through the API. Last but not least is retention, right? And the most important thing here is are developers sticking around? Are, are your customers sticking around or are they leaving? Because there's maybe issues with the API and they found a better solution. So let's just speak on adoption itself real quick. And so here I actually built out uh, what I consider a, a, a healthy adoption funnel for, any, for, for a self-service API product. And there's three steps here. There's sign up which is a signing up right on your website or, or maybe your doc page, um, which express interest in, in exploring your API further. And then we have our first hello world. And this is sending that very first API call that could be through a tool like Postman, a tool like Curl, a um, lot of different uh, technologies out there. And at that point, developer, they, they invested some time to actually explore your API. There's already interest there, there's intent. However, that does not necessarily mean they saw value yet because sending a single API call through, through a tool like Postman is very different than a working solution. And that's where we get to this last step, which is your first working app. And there's a couple of different terms for this. First live app, first uh, revenue generating app, first working app. What we're tracking here is what are the minimum number of, of whether it's API calls, transactions, uh, whatever it is, that you consider as being healthy and, and a working solution. So in this case, we're looking at a payments API and that first hello world is sending a very, the very first API call. We consider this not really a full solution until at least hundred transactions are sent through the application. And there are different ways to measure this, whether it's transaction counts, whether they're using SDK versus using Postman. But again, trying to define that criteria and having a very rigorous set of uh, uh, metrics. The second is engagement. And again, notice here, I don't have API calls. Instead, it's aligned to the customer value that it's received. And this could depend on which industry you're in, what the platform is, is, is trying to do. So if you're an e-commerce platform, that might mean looking at checkout conversion rate. It might mean number of transactions sold through the platform. If you're a SaaS solution, that API uh, a metric might mean a number of different integrations being used, number of different extensions. For data API, it may actually be more tied to the data itself, such as match rate, was it found in the database, was it not found? Because if everything was amiss, if, if nothing was found in, in, in your, your data set, your customers probably didn't have any value or receive any value, even though transactions were still flowing. Lastly, you know, for logistics API, looking at things like successful orders and, and fulfillment orders, because you know, if that order was not fulfilled, again, no value was actually delivered. Maybe the joke is for, for airlines, they should actually consider the time sitting on the tarmac versus you know, actually in the air. So I would actually recommend you know, looking at only those two hours in the air versus the 10 hours sitting on the tarmac given everything in New York. Hopefully they hear me. <laughs> Lastly, looking at retention, you know, how do you actually grow and, and retain your long-term customers. And a good retention curve in this case will sometimes look uh, like a smile or flatten out. What we're measuring here is for each cohort of users or developers that signed up, are they using the API you know, one week later, two weeks later, uh, and, con and continuing on? And so in this case, we see you know, at week zero, of course, 100% of that cohort was active. But once we get to week one, we see the largest drop-off. In this case, for the enterprise segment, 75% uh, of our, that cohort is still active, which means we lost 25% of that cohort. But when we look at self-service, it's even worse, right? We only have 38% of that cohort still active. They're still doing things with the API. So there is a big drop off here. This is still considered healthy retention because it flattens out. Once we get to week eight, 
we still see around 36% of our self-service users are active. And in fact, we actually see that by week eight, it actually jumped up a little bit at 83% because we, we pull back some folks who maybe stopped using in week one because they're waiting on procurement or, or whatever it is that they're waiting on. But in this case, this is a healthy retention curve. Instead, at this, these two curves went down to zero or close to zero. That means, and that tells me I need to focus on you know, the, the, the product itself before I continue to invest in, a, in adoption and marketing and sales and everything else, because people are just not sticking around. Some people might call that a leaky boat. And so the, the main goal here is that infrastructure metrics are aligned to engineering goals, but not necessarily product goals, you know, things like uptime SOAs, performance. So when you start defining those metrics, make sure they're aligned back to adoption, usage or engagement and retention. The last thing I want to mention is how do you manage end of life? You know, do you iterate? Do you deprecate? And this is going to be a tricky decision to make. And it depends on, you know, engineering resources at hand, you know, whether what the revenue or the growth or, or, or number of partners that are being driven through the, the, the platform, uh, what those engagement metrics look like. But eventually you're going to have to make a call. And the biggest thing we recommend is make sure if you do decide to sunset or deprecate an API, handle it gracefully. Make sure you over communicate rather than under communicate, whether that's through email, whether that's through uh, uh, notifications and other things. A little bit about ourselves. Sorry, a little uh, uh, plug here. We're MOSA. We help with a lot of these things, product analytics, user-based billing, and guidance. Any questions? Yeah, one question, Derek. Um, there is a saying which is, um, don't think the best business model for your APIs, but what are the best APIs for your business model? And you show many examples here about different strategy, but like, do you agree with, with that statement? So I can repeat the question. No, the, the question is, there is a statement sometimes shared in, uh, which is, don't think what are the best business model for your, for your APIs, but what are the best, what are the best APIs for your business model? You know, so does that talk to you? Hmm. I've never actually heard that term before, but it, it does somewhat resonate in that, you know, you're actually trying to find a business solution, right? But, you know, at the same time, you have to align it to the API itself, right? And so you know, if I'm looking for, uh, let's say, a text messaging API, you know, there might be one that's self-service. There might be one where I can't actually sign up at all. And so I'm going to start trying to figure out on my own time, should I start using this API? And I'm going to look at their documentation. I'm going to look at um, what their signup process looks like. I'm going to look at how, how much investment does it take before I even see some value from the platform. Yeah, and I really like your slide on the KPIs for APIs, as John Messer used to call them. But, you know, like, you know, the right APIs, having the right success metrics is extremely important. There is also one question about, like, on the pricing, you know, you show that, you know, the first, the time to first, the sign up, the Hello World, the working app, you know, the, uh, the, the mindful, at least, metrics to define a, a really active, uh, whatever, developer. But the thing is, like, you're trying to have full self-service. So sometimes, you know, you will put a bar where actually people will leave because it's just, they're just below the bar, right? Below the pricing or the feature. Like, how can you, it's really a SaaS business model at some point, but at scale, how, what advice could you give to really understand like the, the, the user, uh, you know, and, and really make what, what will make people adopt it versus go away? Sure. One of the biggest things I always recommend is allow a new developer to pick their journey, right? Especially for, you know, if cell service doesn't work for your business because there's regulatory concerns, maybe there's, there's just a lot of setup process and it's perfectly fine to have a more sales led or cost success led motion, you know, to drive adoption. You know, but allow them to take that path, but then allow maybe developers can also get started in a test environment that doesn't have any production data. And so a good example of this would be a company like Stripe and a lot of different financial companies where you cannot deploy that API to production without signing a lot of agreements, but Stripe still allows you to sign up for a test account, right? And so, um, so what you want to do is on your website, you're going to have, hey, I'm a developer, I can sign up get started. But if I need to talk to sales, I need some help, make sure you give them a path. Don't, don't force them to do self-service if, if that's not going to work well. 
Perfect, Derek. Thank you very much for, for that. Thank you. Any other questions? No, no other questions from, uh, from the chat. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. And uh, hopefully everyone has a great rest of the day here at API Days. Thank you, Derek. Have a good one. So uh, uh, yes, and now after thinking this API as a product, uh, these two talks, I will invite uh, fellow colleagues, Ronnie and Mike. All right. Hello, Mike. Hello, Ronnie. How are you? Hey there. Hello, Mehdi. Hello. So unfortunately, Eric is not able to join for, um, let's say, let's consider health reasons. Uh, but uh, he says hi to the community, right? Uh, he's a, he was at the Pieders Helsinki a few weeks ago and in New York, but uh, unfortunately, he can't be there today. We hope him great, um, uh, what do you say that in English? Sorry. Uh, recovery? Recovering, recovering. Yeah. Great recovering. Yeah. So, yeah. Ronnie and Mike, uh, we are fellow co authors of the book Continuous API Management, right? Uh, we've been part of the API Academy together, but you no, know, can you just before we start, can you? Make a quick like. What are what are you currently doing today? <laughs> okay, well, I'll I'll, I'll go. So uh, I'm currently uh, working with a couple of uh, customers on helping them build out their products and platforms strategy. Uh, some very interesting projects. I hope to be able to share pretty soon. And I continue to travel just a little bit. I was in in Europe a couple of months ago. I'll be at San Francisco for IETF next month. And I continue writing. So there are a couple of different projects uh, brewing. Hopefully, by the end of the year, we'll have some more material out there. Another book, I think. Another book, okay. right? <laughs> Perfect. Uh, all right. On my side, I'm, I'm at a consultancy called Publicis Sapient. Uh, I still do a little bit of API work, but you know, just like API has gotten broad, uh, I'm involved in all kinds of things, banking as a service, embedded finance, uh, core list, or core banking modernization, all the inter all the ways we use APIs. Right? So I do a lot of that work. And I don't get to travel as much as I used to. So that's too bad. Yeah, uh, but, you know, next uh, next conference is in London, so you don't have to travel too much, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. So so uh, yeah, I will ask on the back end to put the slides I, I put uh, on the on the uh, on the backstage, if you can. But yeah, the, uh, in the book Continuous API Management, we 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 start we talk about a lot of things about continuously manage your APIs. But let's say yesterday at the event we talk about like especially API management in the context of new technologies like LLMs and others. But uh, I think we have the best team here to to maybe get the basis the the basics. Uh, 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 on, on a perfect definition. So, and I really like, not because I'm, I'm part of the book authors, but I really like how we define, you know, API man management, right? You know, and how it is to managing API. So I would love we start by trying to define API management, if that's. Well, <laughs> Mike, I, I think, ahead, yeah. no, I think Meta, you should start with that one and then we'll we'll take it from there. You, you give us your, your story. No, no. For me, uh, managing APIs and actually continuously managing APIs is all the practice enabling, um, enabling to uh, uh, to uh, understand, produce, and secure, and make uh, make them uh, make them evolve uh, and make the APIs evolve. Right? It's all of this, and that's actually what we define in the ten pillars of API uh, management, which are, which are. If I go by uh, by memory, which is strategy, <laughs> design, documentation, development, testing, deployment, um, um, uh, security, security, monitoring, uh, promotion, discovery, and versioning. So that's really the ten pillars yeah. we, define, wow. we define in the book. And uh, yeah, so it's all the practice that really represent represent that. Yeah, and and I would add, I would add to that. That's impressive. I I don't think I could have done that ten step. That's excellent. I would also add to that. I think one of the other things we talk about in the book a lot is the platform, the landscape, as as Eric uh, often calls it. Right. So it isn't just managing one API, but it's managing lots of APIs. Uh, and you have enough APIs. There's always some API that's in some version or some transition or some test case. So it's a it's a heterogeneous ecosystem that you manage as well, and I think people are realizing more and more that's where the platform aspect to it uh, comes in as well. So those pillars of an API, as well as all of the factors that go into uh, managing the landscape, are really really important. 
And actually, I, I love uh, when we were brainstorming about the book. I think we, we we there was a sentence we tried to coin. I think I was pushing for it, but it was like from zero to few to many APIs, right? And so yep. you have different maturity models. You have different, let's say, scaling scalability uh, practice. You know, managing really few. The first ones you will really craft and you will really nurture into your uh, the top practice, thinking of them as products, right? But then then the landscaping idea of Eric would be like, okay, with few of them, it's fine. But with thousands of them, like we need to scale all of this. We need to scale testing, deployment, de development. We need to scale design. So, so that's really this, the, uh, this idea. And yes, and, and, and Ronnie, you were mostly talking about the maturity part, right? You know? Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. So we wrote that book twice, right? When, when did yeah. we write it first? Does anyone remember? That was 12, 13? 15. Right. So, so where was yeah. the industry? Industry was APIs were were understood as valuable and people were still struggling with, okay, how do I use them? Then we did a second edition after microservices have, have exploded, right? And now we're talking about it a few years later. I think absolutely maturity is part of it. If we just key on the management part, right? Management is pretty simple. Management is we've got assets or resources. How do we make them cost efficient? And how do we make them drive value, right? And if you're managing yep. people, there'd be a way to do that. I think a lot of what we describe here is very similar to how you manage people. I think the magic is, okay, how do you apply that to this thing called an API? And just like you talked about scale, Mehdi, you know, if you're managing five people versus 5,000, that's fundamentally different. Uh, and from a maturity perspective, I think it's the same. If you're, if you're managing a junior group versus a seasoned group of people, that's also fundamentally different, right? And it's true with APIs. And I know we'll get to this in the discussion, but we are on the verge of another one of those big changes that's fundamentally going to change the, the cost and value of what we're managing. But, you know, I think we all know what that is. We'll talk about that later, I hope. Yeah, and actually, do you consider like the... the, the, um, it, the we have a sentence in the book, like, you know, on the API maturity life cycle, which is the right investment for the right phase. Also, there's, there's this number aspect, this number dimension. But these is also we have this um, idea of different phase, you know, from the, the, the before it's published, after it's published, when its value realized, when it goes to maintenance and retirement. Right. You know, so we have also this there's really multiple dimensions. So the number that you want to create how important they are in your system, how old they are, or how, let's say, aligned with their true value. You know, so it seems it seems quite a, uh, quite a, quite difficult for any manager to have this all these degrees of understanding, don't you think? Absolutely, yes, yeah. yes, it's hard, it's hard work. Yes, the short answer. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> and, and 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 so if, for me, I really think that. Actually, the goal is to catch up the maximum of certitudes in this uncertain practice, you know, that has too many degrees of liberty. And so, yeah, we hope the book helps at least catch catch a few of them. Right. So now, now we started about the the really more today about the book, what's in the book, what API management, the ten pillars, the maturity phase, you know, and stuff like that. Um, Yesterday we really we opened the conference with Eric Newcomer, former CTO of WSO2 and now author at the New Stack and, and the editor at the New Stack actually. We talk about the latest trends. And it's one of the first trends we talk about is really the commoditiz commoditization of API management, actually of the API gateway. So I will just ask you a question like, is the gate 10 years ago we were the gateway was something, right? The gateway was the center of discussion. Now it's it's over. The gateway is just a it's, the, it's like the, the, the keyboard on a computer. It's, it's obvious it's there, right? Well, Ronnie, you, you, uh, you talked about that many years ago, didn't you? And kind of upset a few people along the way. Well, you know, firstly, the keyboard is important, right? <laughs> like, I'm, I need a keyboard. Uh, I, need, I need an API gateway, too. You know, commoditization doesn't mean that something doesn't have value. It just means that there's less of a differentiation between products, right? So it's easy to replace one with the other. Now, I'll say having worked with lots of clients and they go through the phases of picking different vendors, right? There's obviously differences. Uh, I think um, it's not commoditized to the point that the company behind 
the gateway product doesn't matter anymore right it's still it's still a partnership a relationship right you pick you pick a product based on the team that will take you there the other thing that's happened is well http get put post delete got commoditized well we didn't know was that people would just keep adding different ways to do apis right like so you'd get graphql and then you'd get uh event based and then you know other asynchronous flavors so there's there's still room for catching up staying ahead uh, and differentiating your product. Uh, and Mike, what, what are you seeing on your side? Well, no, I, I think that's exactly right. So, you know, to just to leap ahead, commoditization is just one of the steps in the process. If you uh, if you think about this, and 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 I agree with you 100%. Commoditization is not a negative term. It's it's a state. It's a state. It's a plan. A lot of this has to do with what do you have to do unique for you? What can you purchase on the market so you don't have to do it uniquely? What is so commoditized that everybody has the same thing you do? So a lot of times what commoditized means is everybody's operating on the same rules. There's no clear advantage if you're in the commoditized space. So this has a lot to do not just with managing your APIs, but also the products you offer to others. Where are your products in this mix? Are, are your products fighting in the commoditized space? Are you have you got a healthy offering in the in the marketplace that's not commoditized, or is is your product so unique that nobody else can do it? That changes all sorts of other strategies about how you would design and build and maintain your product as an API for an ecosystem. So, the the trend of commoditization is just one step in the trend of moving in Wardley maps from left to right, right, or some kind of circle when we talk about our circle. Of 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 cycling. So, uh, that's just one one step on the uh, you know on the journey, and it's important to keep the other steps in mind at all times. What's commoditized now? Wh uh, what's going to get commoditized later? All those kinds of things I think are important as well in this idea of managing your APIs. So yeah, and and in the state of the API industry, uh, I take three examples. The first one is all the acquisition of let's say API management companies that have a, a, that have been in the past. Uh, Broadcom acquires, acquiring CA, who had acquired Layer 7, who has who had acquired Runscope, you know, all this stuff. Or MuleSoft, who, um, acquired by Salesforce, and, you know, APG acquired by, acquired by Google. You know, all this, first, all the vendors acquire the solution, you know, to show that it's it should be a de facto product, right? So that's the thing. The second thing is the explosion of open source, you know. So WSO2 was a pioneer with open source API management solution, but over the last six, seven years, like Kong went open source, uh, a gravity tyke uh, and plenty other. Oh, three scale was also open source acquired by Red Hat, acquired by IBM too. <laughs> so it's really about right. like all of this really represent uh, kind of a lot of commoditization. And even I've just seen recently a company called Zuplo. I don't know if you've heard about them, but they do yeah. like API gateway uh, as code, right? You know, it's a text file. Right? I don't remember if it's YAML or whatever, but it's mm -hmm. it's. It's a, a specification for gateway. It's a text file, and a, and you and you your developer can just type the what they want in the gateway and push it in production. Like it's like a, a, swa, a, a an open API definition, but just for the gateway functionalities, like infrastructure as code for Amazon. So it's really, it's it has shift left also uh, really really hard. Yeah, that's you that's know, actually very fascinating. Pro you know, probably what what stopped it from being truly commoditized is we never got to the point where. I could take all of the investment I made in product A, all those rules, all the configuration, and just drop it into product B, right? Let's be honest, because there's so much so much uh, stickiness with these things, yep. right? They're all kind of bespoke, which is preventing like true commoditization. But the last note on the topic is, I know the companies you mentioned, I think everyone everyone kind of read the writing that the gateway part is getting commoditized. But a lot of those companies describe their value is not the gateway, right? It's the admin, right. it's the it's the Kubernetes, it's the scaling, it's the like the other parts, right? So they kind of moved away from ten years ago when we were talking about it. It was about you know not introducing message latency and performing security. Well, that is not going to get you into any room anymore, right? That's the <laughs> basic expectation. So it's harder to find is the delighters or the utility functions that really get you you know ahead of your competitors. So you talk about security and latency, and, and actually that's two of the trends we talked with uh, 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 yesterday. I will start maybe by the maybe the latency aspect. 
the, the real time demand, I don't know if it's really, it has been from the tech side or the business side, and actually I would love your opinion on that, but like really revive this event-driven architecture. Uh, you know, like we talk about messaging since in the software industry for a really long time, it was just out of fashion. Um, but, but yeah, it seems it's back. And why it has been so, so let's say, back so hardly? Is it because of the async API? Is it because of business demands? Or to your mind, why why uh, event driven architecture is so hyped these days? Yeah. So actually, Ronnie and I were are just finishing up a report on this space, and I think one of the things that that uh, that I've noticed, and Ronnie can comment on this as well, is the technology has changed enough that the barrier of entry for event driven architecture of the ver of various kinds, whether it's IOT driven or just you know commerce or business driven, uh, the the barrier of entry is low enough that we can do this more and more. Now you could think about that as moving from that sort of unique category to the product category. Uh, there's a lot of market options. There are a lot of platforms that really cater to this kind of event driven or asynchronous, or to think about it even more directly, uh, you know, really shortening the distance between. When the, when the event happens and when the message appears in some data store. So I think there it's just easier. Uh, that means people are thinking more creatively. There are more demands, more mobile devices means I expect to hear right away anyway. So I think a lot of that is just driven by technology. You know how there's sort of this pat pattern where technology gets ahead of, uh, of uh, conceptual thinking and products and then products move and get ahead of technology. I think we're just in that phase where those those products uh, can really grow a lot more. I don't know, Ronnie, what do you think? Yeah, I, th I think that's right. There's, I see two primary drivers on the business side. There's absolutely rising customer expectations. And that's not just in the mass market. I mean, a, for a large corporate dealing with a big bank, up until a few years ago, you might have been okay with it's a file-based thing. But now, you know, because you use so much stuff on your phone, you're, you know, why can't I just do something and it happens, right? So there's this huge pressure for real time, which if you don't have the tech is hard. And then the other big driver on the tech side, for the last few years, we've been saying, let's break all the monoliths up into small things. And then people started doing that. They said, okay, when you break it up, each of those things should have their own little pieces of data. So we started doing that. But then to synchronize all that data, you suddenly need this whole world of asynchronous, event-driven, right? That's the only way to really make it work, it turns out. So that just created added pressure to jump into this world, right? So everything needs to be capable of streaming, of being real time, of you know being almost instant. So, so Mike, it seems like the software industry like repeats itself. New technologies enable old models to be more performant. So we go back to these models, and these models become mainstream. And so new technologies will will get new older models, you know, to be more performant, and we will go back. So. Because it seems like monolith, microservice, monolith, microservice, or uh, as synchronous, asynchronous. You know, over the last forty years of software, it seems it's it's what's happening. So that's really that's really uh, uh, interesting at some point. But also, I will just share you a um, uh, like it's not a joke actually. It's re it's it's real. But I talked to a, a chief architect at a at a really important social network. Cannot name it directly, but. And we had this discussion about what is real time, and he asked me. He asked me the question like, "How much? How fast is real time for you for a request?" So I said, "Okay, like I don't know, ten milliseconds." He said, "No, we know too late." I said, "One ah. millisecond." I said, "One millisecond." He said, "No, no." He said, "Okay, one hundred microseconds." And actually, Nginx used to make demos where they were showing like microseconds requests, right? You know, so. Uh, on their on their really lightweight uh, um, um, API management and, and uh, proxy, and say no 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 say what like one microsecond? He say less than that. He say now come on like zero, and he told me less than that. He say what is crazy? Not actually because they were telling me the business demand of real time, and and let's say uh, uh, the constraint on user experience. Say actually they provision all the potential all the potential next actions in the app. Yep. to be below zero. So he told me, of course, it doesn't make sense physically, but in terms of user experience, he say, we provision the next actions in cache in the app to actually be, to be below zero. When he clicks, it's already there. It's local. It doesn't go through the network. So yep. it's just to show an example of how the business demand is pushing on this real time that I was not expecting. 
Yeah, and I and I would just add to that um, that what what the business demand has done is change the rules on design and implementation of the application itself, and it's it's creating a way to start using that predictability, using your behavior, using past information to start thinking ahead of what you do, and that that is sort of almost sort of the negative cash, right? Is the idea that I'm going to send the possibilities to you first. And of course, I've been talking about sending possibilities and messages for 20 years. There are lots of reasons why we might start to pay attention to what somebody might want to do next. And again, technology is making this easier than it's ever been, easier and cheaper to do. And that's why I think we're seeing more of it. So really, does it make sense to, uh, to be below zero <laughs> on a request? It does. And I believe I've heard Mike talk about that like years ago, right? And even from an yep. HTTP perspective that, you know, this is the whole point of things like get because you can pre-cache and you can be optimistic about what someone might do and it's not going to change. So, you know, Roy Fielding, all of those guys. I mean, this is not something no one had done. What it takes is for people to apply it. And there's just never enough of that, right? Like, so yeah. a smart person who sees the potential of a feature like that and actually implements it, I mean, that's the magic. Yeah, Mike told everything that would happen uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, still waiting. <laughs> yeah, just just waiting, right? Just, just waiting. That's all, just waiting. <laughs> so, um, uh, yes, and one of the other trends that may be a little more complex, we, we don't tackle that too much, at least in the book, which is the the security, the compliance, you know, all this post-COVID like you know endpoints that were like in the out out in the wild, these shadow APIs that have been open like really really fast just to be because it was it was the mess uh, because of the COVID nineteen digitalization, and so yeah, so it's companies are like we've seen many many tools appearing, many companies you know providing API security, claiming the gate claiming the the classic API management solution were not good enough with these new threats. So do you also see that in the, in the company you consult with? You know, I, I think I think the statement, look, security will never be good enough. I mean, that's a, that is a never ending war, right? So, which is why it's a wonderful place to sell software into, because uh, there's always something you can do better. I do think we're reaching a point where large organizations are wanting, you know, we haven't, we haven't revisited our security stack in a while on the API side. Uh, and now with some of the tech changes, you're starting to see, okay, maybe there's opportunities. Usually I'm seeing um, interest in one of two areas. Can you do something at the macro level? So rather than message security, traffic security, right? So we see a few vendors there, like looking at patterns, trying to detect and diagnose. Uh, and then the second area is around just like lowering cost of doing security in the first place. Can you shift it left? Can you make it faster? Can you make it smoother, easier, right? But I, I do think it's a little bit different from like early days where, you know, there was OAuth 1 and OAuth 2 and man, that was a big change, right? I, I think we're at a point where it's pretty stable. Security is pretty decent. As soon as I say that, someone will pull out 10, 10 examples, right? But, you know, just as a general rule, pretty decent. It's, it's you know, we've got good standards and we've got a, a good way of connecting. It's the, the extra stuff, I think, where there's opportunity. Yeah, I would I would add a couple of things to that. I think I think one of the things that's happening is just we were, as we were talking before about negative caching or zero, you know, under zero caching. I think understanding the possibilities gives us a different security matrix. Uh, if I know that it's likely that the next step that you are going to do on your mobile app is one of these five things, and you do six or seven, number six or seven on the list, I can be curious about that. I can actually start to say, well, my prediction was off. Why is that? If, if, um, if we want to design systems that are actually really good at security, we have to start designing systems that are really good at predicting and understanding what's going on. And we've got some opportunities to do that. You know, there's a famous Michael Nygaard quote, which is, you can't eliminate bugs, you can only survive them. And I think the same thing applies to security breaches as well. We have different kinds of security breaches, right? We have cases where people design things poorly But then we also have cases where somebody breaks in, where somebody does a robbery. And we've had you know, robberies of banks and all sorts of things for centuries. 
Um, but uh, we try to figure out how to make them uh, as inconsequential as we can and non-destructive as we can. So I think I think that we're going to see a lot more in that area as well. Uh, the financial industry has all sorts of ways of surviving credit card fraud, for example. Uh, we need to do more of that kind of uh, surviving, I think, in your IT space as well. So just as Ronnie was talking about traffic versus um, maybe individual uh, uh, transactions or applications, I think also we need to start thinking about the difference between um, a particular activity or some particular design versus the way we build the infrastructure itself. Maybe you've got to be insured to be participating. Maybe you have to have certain uh, uh, things in place before you're certified to be able to, to move money around. There are lots of other things that we can do to create more security and make it more survivable, lower the consequence as well as lower the rate of, of occurrence. But uh, like, so it depends what we mean by security. Like Mehdi, you, you have been actively over the last few years diving into things like privacy, right? Data, do you consider that part of security? I mean, you can, you can tell us about that. Yeah, I, I consider, for, for me, security is being sure that what you wanna keep secret and for yourself, stay secret and for yourself, and what you allow others to open, uh, what you open, what you what you open for others is always at the right level, right? Always at the right level and in the right organization. So, so and of course, privacy regulations, all the things that actually needs to have control and limitation. For me, they are part of security. They are part of security. Security is not just like you know, is the secret breach or not? Is there are different flavors? There are many shades of security, but uh, um, uh, the, the goal is to be sure that actually what's shared only what 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 needs to be shared and with the right person so 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 for me that's secret is the um, uh, it's not only the internal aspect or whatever it's the op it's also open in the world so of course privacy regulations when you are not allowed to share data to a specific country or for a specific usage which is really new like gdpr ccpa in california colopia in colorado and and, and many many other regulations actually 60 for example allow you to check for the purpose of the, 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 the call, the API call, for example. So the same API can call the same data, uh, the, same, the same data, mm -hmm. the same resource for the, uh, for the same, for example, end application like a CRM. But if it's for marketing purposes, because you have the consent of the user, you can do it. If it's for commercial purposes, and you don't have the consent, you should not be able to do it. So that leads to a term that is really new, which is purpose-based access management, which now you will need to understand not only, it's not just the app, the scope, the authorization, the right database, you know, the, the, the right access, the read access. It's not just like an architectural point of view. It's really the end use point of view, the marketing point of view, or the business point of view that needs to be in the business, in the logic. And companies are not able to do that, at least some have tried, and and uh, and I've 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 been a witness to to see that uh, they are not they were not able to do it. Yeah, and you know that what you described about the way people behave in certain contexts is the way we've run businesses face to face for centuries, right? I'm sorry, I can't give you that information because you're blah, or you're 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 going to use it for this purpose or that. So figuring how to bring all of that success and all of that learning and intellectual property into the IT world is definitely going to be a challenge. But like Ronnie says, you know, security is an evergreen space. I'm sure there's lots of opportunity out there for that. Yeah, but if an application has an access to a specific scope to that data, for an architect, for a developer, fine, that works. I can do the request a second time and a third time and a fourth time. And actually, no, because now you have to check the country where it's uh, the user, the consent, if it's still active or not, if it retrie retrieved consent. So, it's not yeah. a physical access anymore. It's not a physical access. Now you yeah. have legal access. A legal... That's exactly right. So yeah. that's uh, that's really, really complex. Yep. So now we talk about the business being involved, uh, you know, business decisions. There is also a fourth trend we talked about, which is the no-code trend. You know, how we, can un how we can build APIs to feed no-code tools or no-code integration inside our organization where actually business owners or business managers can actually code without doing shadow IT. You know, they actually build a business application without, in the realm of IT, right? So is it something you've also seen, you know, the, the no-code era and how, it, and how to build APIs for the, 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 the no-code tooling? Go ahead, Ronnie. So the question was, 
specific to, I just want to make sure, specific to how do you build APIs to be compatible with? Yeah, no let's, say, let's say, is no code a strategy, a strategy or at least a question that maybe you're the, the, the company you work with, actually, uh, when they build APIs, they do they think, okay, we need to be sure we integrate to the no code tools we use internally because we don't have enough developers and business people wants to have this. Love, wants to have the ability to build apps on the, on the team. So the reason I was clarifying the question because it, it was interesting to me because I've not seen that at all. So I've not I've not seen uh, an API team purposefully design APIs so that they're compatible with no code, low code. I've usually seen the opposite, right? So the the people who implement the no code, low code stuff have to make sure that it can use all the APIs in the estate, right? It's an interesting idea, uh, but I don't know if I would recommend it that way personally. I don't know, Mike, if you if you've seen that. Well, well, I I can I can think of a of a current engagement that I'm working on right now where there's a, a it's a global uh, uh, organization, and there are parts of the organization that have a lots and lots of IT resources, and other parts of the organization that have very very few IT resources, and there needs to be some global level governance and design and consistency across the entire operation. That means some people are doing whatever amounts to no code for, you know, the no being a variable. So some organizations, they have lots of effort that they can put into it, some they can't. That's one of the places where no code makes a lot of sense, where it's not something where I'm not as smart as everyone else. I'm not a, a coder. I don't have a, a set of resources available to me. I don't have an IT shop. I'm a small organization, a small company or a small vendor or a small provider. So designing systems where that works with, for varying levels of participation, I think is really important. Um, what, I, what I saw early on was this idea of no code mimicking, uh, sort of automating what humans would do if they were coding. So that's code generation or reading things live and then you know coming up with some stub or some other solution, whether it's runtime or design time. What I'm seeing more and more are people saying, well, for this audience, we need this kind of interface. For this audience, we need that kind of interface. And in that sense, I've, I've got some experience where I'm seeing organizations designing specifically to make their product available for people who are you might call citizen developers. Actually, I agree with you, Rani. The, the first move I've seen is, uh, is like, Okay, you are doing shadow IT on your own. Are you, you need to... are you scoring it? Because then I get I get a point. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get one point. One point for running, right? Just one. At least one, right? <laughs> now, now, really having this no code like uh, in IT say, okay, you want to use Airtable, you want to use Notion, you want to use Make, you want to use Zapier. It has to be in the realm of security and on how we govern stuff. So now, and all these no code tools actually begins to have that enterprise. Uh, versions at some point yes, uh, yes. where where you know things can be better governed for example i've seen i cannot name the company but some business managers who were not knowing what is a scope so they were putting just scope all to all apps connecting to the Airtable database they were doing because it needs a culture right it needs a culture an it culture yeah. to understand how it works but then the epi teams have been mandated to make plugins to Notion, to Airtable, to Zapier with internal APIs for business people to be able to, to, to use them. So it's really the, this both sides, this both sides. But first is, as you say, Rani, security, governance, you know, has to be accepted. And then we mix our APIs into that. And so actually that leads to this, the, the latest trend, which is uh, uh, where everything can be said, which is the LLM trend, right? You know, the chat GPT and all the different LLMs. Like, and my question is like today, and it, we, we, it's so hot that actually you can, you can say anything, right? It will be obsolete yeah. in a few weeks. <laughs> but like, what, would, what advice you would give to a company who try to get into that game with their own APIs, like consuming these APIs and maybe mixing their APIs with their L, these LLMs, you know, on, to, to make plugins, to uh, to be sure, uh, you know, like what on API management level, what would be the advice you could you could give if you could, can give any? 
I'll just start with some of the basics. I've, I've had some discussions with a handful of people over this over the last year. And I, the first thing I tell people is, you know what, this is, this is not new. This is just an extension, right? So whether it's uh, code completion for developers or whether it's using templates or whether it's using code generators, now we're just to the point where it's, we're, we're getting a sort of a shorter distance between what I want and what I see, right? Because LLMs are generating code, they're generating open API specs and so on and so forth. We've had generators before. Um, the other thing that I would say is, you know, I would think of uh, large language models very similar to uh, fully self-driving uh, cars, right? Do you want to get in a fully self-driving car and go to sleep and then uh, have it take you to where you're going to go? Well, that's exactly the way I think about LLMs as well. Do you want to just go ahead and tell it, okay, give me this and then go to sleep and then, you know, take whatever they, they offer and then put that in production? Of course, we don't. So all we're really doing is trying to figure out what can we automate? What, what drudgery can we take out safely and still get quality materials? So I, I think, sure, there's, there's lots of opportunity. I'm really, really impressed with the way OpenAI has kind of given us all a dopamine fix for uh, large language models. We want to interact. We want to sort of predict about what it's going to do and say. And we ask it all sorts of questions and in, in the process, give them all sorts of personal data. I think it's a brilliant scheme. But we've had lang large language models for over 10 years, and we'll have other models as well. Treat this just like you treat anything else. It's a step along the way. Right now, I think there's way too many foot guns for me to use this in any serious production way, but I am doing lots of experiment. You know, Mike, I'm gonna disagree with you here. Uh, I, right. I don't, I, it doesn't feel like an incremental step. This feels different. This feels era defining. Uh, firstly, because of the pace at which Yes, we had we had AI ML. Uh, there was BERT, and then LLMs. I mean, and the stuff. I mean, I think in our community we were playing with GitHub Copilot before, you know, the CEOs yeah. learned about ChatGPT, right? Yeah. But the thing is, they did learn about it, and almost overnight, uh, everything had to talk about AI, right? Almost overnight, we all had to start considering it. Um, and it certainly feels like with all the resources that are going into it and the, the speed at which I'm seeing not just talk, but implementation, uh, just about every client I have, they have like whole teams who are implementing. We've got large banks who are uh, creating enterprise grade shared AI services with like, how do we do data management? I really do think within five to 10 years, we might see that, you know, of course, APIs will be there, uh, but they just may not be, it may not be as important to have good APIs, right? So we, we could be at the beginning of the decline of what we think about as API design, right? Because when the cost of integration gets low enough, right. you know, the value of really easy to use, easy to change API, APIs fundamentally goes down. Yeah, I, I would say on that last step, we may find that the cost and effort needed to get usable APIs that solve a problem may have may be drastically lower, right? It doesn't mean they're well designed. It doesn't mean they're poorly designed. It means whether or not they work. And there's a, there's a high effort for a lot of them today. So AI models of various types could very much lower, lower the bar quite a bit. And I think that's, I think that's good. It reminds me, Stenek, Nemec, you know, who are was pushing for the like six, seven years, the word autonomous APIs, you know, when finally yep. software will finally be able to integrate other software without interaction of humans. And now he's doing this um, uh, super face uh, yep. uh, AI, right? Uh, so that reminds me this idea, but, but on API management level, it may have some, some issues, you know, like for example, if your users prefer the LLM interface to interact with you, with your API or your, or your data versus the direct, you know, your direct portal. So the LLM will be kind of a, a backend where they will have to give their API key, whatever, right? There is also the, for example, the temperature. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, for people who are not familiar with temperature, temperature is like a, it's a number between zero to one where you allow the generative, the generation of text or or, or image to, to go, uh, uh, to, to be imaginative, right? You know, so if you are at zero, it's just facts. The, the, there is no generation of text. If you go to more to one, 
he generates, he can actually make up stuff. He can, he can really be creative, right? And so I've seen companies who are asking me like, can, do you know a gateway where actually we can put in a policy? I don't want to be used in a, by a LLM, an LLM with a temperature more than 0.2 or more than 0.5. I don't want my data to be used in a more generative way because I'm a, for example, I'm a law firm and I want to be sure that what I say doesn't, is not changed, right? So I see, I think there is a new pattern, a new model about how my data can be reused and API will be at the, at the front of it. Yeah, I think the, the, go ahead. The, the, the value of data is fundamentally changed. So like, here's, here's the thing that shifts. So right now, what we focus on is the channel and the interface, right? And in the future, you might just see a shift to focusing on the data itself. Uh, and then the last part of the shift is even what your channel looks like, right? Today, we talk about things like embedding into someone's app or site. And then tomorrow, maybe it's just about plugging into the three most popular chatbots in the world, like full stop. Yeah, I, I think the other thing that, you know, as if we sort of step back and we think about the notion of API management in general and platforms and products, we've talked about a handful of topics already, things like security and maturity modeling and life cycling, all of which gnarly problems can be improved by throwing uh, AI at the problem, predicting one's behavior, understanding when you're sort of out of scope from what you normally do, making decisions for you about what the next likely decision you're going to make is in order to improve the responsiveness of the app. All those things can be handled with LLM type technologies or other ones that we would see later. So it isn't just AI as the end, but it's AI as the means to solve all problems on all the spectrum from the initial design through the implementation, the testing, the penetration, the security, the privacy evaluation, all through the life cycle as well. So I think we, as long as we think of these as tools and opportunities rather than simply as ends themselves, I think we're gonna find tons and tons of great ways to apply this kind of technology. And, you know, in very many ways, you'd said this earlier, Mehdi, um, throughout all the decades, the uh, technology changes, but the problems are pretty much the same. How do we do this efficiently, effectively, safely, at scale, uh, and all those other things that we you know, sort of think of as, as non-functional elements? And AI in general can help us with a lot of that. I think. Someone made a statement about, you know, like, should we go into the LLMs? Who should we make plugins? He said that, yeah, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, if you were not allowing Google to crawl your website with robot.txt, you know, uh, but, you know, you were not existing in the results. So you were not existing, yep. you know? Yeah. And so, uh, because when Google has been leader, like, you know, you had to be on Google, you had search engine optimization. With LLMs having hundreds of million of users, if you're not in the results, Right? If you don't exist in the results, you know you may not exist, and especially because they don't give the source at least yet. So you want to be the one when you ask for a flight, ask for a hotel, what, what's the best book author on this topic. You want to be sure it's your books that goes there. You want to be sure it's <laughs> your hotels, right? You want, to, you want to exist. You want to be discovered. And so this is why some companies say, okay, they will. I don't care about copyright. I want to exist to these 100 or 200 million users. That are actually asking questions, and I'm the answer. But if I'm if I don't connect the, the source of truth, I will never exist. You know, so that's some businesses are really afraid to miss and to not exist in this in this text interface. Well, so that's let me just yeah, let me just say that that's a whole nother business, and that is making sure you exist, and that's remote tasking, right? That's hiring all sorts of people to mark up content to make sure that that content is consumable and available. And that's a whole nother world of mechanical turking that's going on behind the scenes that we're not talking a lot about. And you're exactly right. People want to make sure they're in the data stream. That's a different story than using the data stream, right? So that's a really, really good point. So I'm sorry, Ronnie, I interrupted you. I think along the same lines, but if, if I think about this community, it's really built on, hey, can the web be open can data be interchanged? How do we how do we make things more open? I mean, going back to HTTP, www, whereas the AI thing starts to feel like there's no value in being open. 
and there's maybe a shift to being closed and it's more like what Mike is describing. So amongst a set of closed systems, how do I embed my messaging and sell my stuff into those closed systems? Because if I just let you use my data, you monetize it and I'm left out, right? And we've seen a couple of very high profile cases of you know, companies shutting down APIs, shutting down things faster than before because they're getting monetized, right? Without yep. getting a shot by of somebody outcome. else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, question, and uh, we we hope we have some time to answer if it doesn't go too fast. For the last two minutes we have, I will just ask you now. Now, LLM for API management. Uh, did you see like some uh, API definitions, you know, created by LLMs, or did you see some API documentation created by LLMs? And if you see, if you've seen any, what do you think about them? I'll just say quickly, I have seen some examples of open API and protobuf and human readable documentation, and none of them were good enough to put in production. In other words, they're good starter material, but they're nowhere near uh, usable, safe, secure, or anything I'd put in production. Yet. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. But yeah, no, I I have the same. Uh, I have the same uh, statement. Yeah. But uh, conclusion. Uh, Rani, did you see anything interesting into the building, the designing, the development, the deployment, the security of APIs with LLMs? Oh, it's, it's still it's still experimental. I mean, for sure, we've seen examples of people uh, playing with the code, like right using helpers to write the code. Absolutely. Uh, but no, I ha I haven't seen anyone do production grade. I designed the API by asking AI some questions and I just launched it directly. Not yet, uh, but you know, look, go, go anywhere, go on LinkedIn. You'll see stuff like Mike Kelly's doing like using open banking, AI driven. Yeah. And none of that's gonna see light of day until everyone gets over the governance and regulatory fears, right? But showing yeah. it's possible is the first step, right? The other stuff will, yeah. come. It will happen. Yep. I just got, I just got distracted by the question too. <laughs> <laughs> Insects and animals. Are we, are we answering that? Maybe you answer that. Which which question? So, question somebody point? posted yeah somebody posted a question ah. about uh, insects and animals on our books. Why do we why do we have this dog? Why why uh, so our last if, uh, API Academy book was a fish or something or a snail? If if first we don't choose the animal, first we don't right. choose the animal, right? Secondly, yep. the animal is chosen according to the the the, the content of the book. So. For example, it's a it's a it's a shepherd on our side because it's a we talk about the governance aspect and we talk about alignment and you know being sure that um, uh, being sure that you know it stays aligned and stay coherent over time. You know the the APIs aspect uh, aspect, but also if I remember, Aureli also tried to uh, promote uh, endanger, endangered species, yep. especially. So this one is a is a is actually a um, a dog a dog uh, shepherd. Uh, we say shepherd or shelter. No, Doug. Doug yes, shepherd. either way. Yeah. Okay. Shepherd, yeah. Which is actually it's a Welsh it's a Welsh dog, which is actually shorter on his feet uh, than than the other one that every every shepherd is is uh, is, uh, is breeding. So it's an endangered species. So it seems that they they mix the theme of the book with animals and most of the time endangered species. You know, to give them more visibility at least. On, on software books and also because they also have this uh, safari uh, marketing and stuff. So at least from last time I talked to someone already about why a dog, why this dog, this is the answer I had. Good enough for me. I like it. It's a good story. Yeah, so that was uh, the, the at least, but you can ask really directly about uh, how they, uh, why they decided to do that. But uh, yeah, I think uh, what I said is at least 80% of the, of the real answer. Cool. Perfect. For we'll an LLM, more. that's not too bad. <laughs> yeah, we will see. We will see. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, Ronnie. A big uh, thought for Eric uh, for a good recovery. Yep. And yes, and yep. we go for a 20-minute break and being back to the last segment of, of the day, but not the least. See you in 20 right. minutes. Thank you. Bye-bye.